really comfortable performing some of these procedures because some of them I've never done or I haven't even seen. And it's just because they're so rare. And I thought if I'm feeling this way, then maybe some of my colleagues also feel this way. Um, but it's important to know these procedures, so let's jump right in. Uh, this is the first case. So we have a 28 year old female who um, comes in with right eye pain and decreased uh, visual acuity after uh, being assaulted. Um, her vitals are as follows. She's a little tachycardic, uh, uncomfortable on exam. Uh, she doesn't have much visual acuity in the, in the right eye. You can only perceive light. She's got significant kenosis, uh, swelling, and uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. You grab your tonal pen and check a pressure and it's uh, 45. So what's the diagnosis? Yeah, retrovolvo hematoma, exactly. And what does this patient need? Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> By a show of hands, who here has done this procedure? Okay. Who's seen it but haven't done, hasn't done it? Yeah, exactly. So, I, yeah, I saw this once in the CQ. Uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do it. So the indications for this is basically orbital compartment syndrome, right? Anything that accumulates in the retrovolvo space, uh, for example, retrovolvo hemorrhage, either due to trauma, um, patients who are post-op from eye surgery are also at risk for this because of uh, risk of bleeding. Um, basically, the pressure accumulates and causes the globe to push outward, which is a problem because the globe is in an enclosed space and it doesn't really have anywhere to go. So this uh, buildup of pressure um, can result in optic nerve ischemia, uh, which can be very bad. Uh, the classic number to watch out for is an intraocular pressure greater than 40. And if that's the case, then you basically need to perform lateral cathotomy. The goal is to allow the globe to come forward and um, relieve the pressure. However, if, if you do have a high suspicion for this diagnosis and your pressure is a little less than 40, you should still go ahead and perform this procedure. How do you pre uh, prepare for this procedure? You don't need much. Uh, you just need some lidocaine, a pair of hemostats, small scissors, uh, and some pickups. <coughs> <clears throat> so here's an overview of the procedure. Uh, first up is you're going to inject some uh, lidocaine with epi uh, for pain control. And then you're going to grab your hemostats and you're going to crush the lateral canthus. And that's to control any type of bleeding um, that you're going to encounter in this procedure, which you will. Um, after that, you're going to cut the lateral canthus with your scissors. And then you're going to feel for the lateral canthal tendon. Um, it's hard to see because of the amount of, uh, sheer amount of blood uh, that's involved. Uh, apparently, it feels like a guitar string. Uh, and then the lateral canthal tendon has two, um, the superior cruise and an inferior cruise. You're supposed to snip the inferior cruise, after which you're going to recheck a pressure. If your pressure is still elevated, then you have to go ahead and snip the uh, superior cruise. Let's go ahead and watch the video. Uh, 
uh, comes in with fatigue and syncope. Uh, she's bradycardic and hypotensive, uh, a little sleepy but arousable. You do an EKG and you see complete heart block, right? So this patient needs a transgenic spacer. So that's the next procedure. How many of you have done a pacer? Oh, okay, fair amount of people. All right. <clears throat> so the indications for this procedure are your unstable bradycardia, uh, your Mobitz type two and your third degree heart blocks, um, sinus node dysfunction, such as sinus arrest, uh, your tachybrady, six sinus syndromes, or uh, symptomatic severe sinus bradycardia. Uh, another indication is the presence of a new bundle branch block and the setting of an acute MI. Um, because these patients have a higher mortality rate and a greater incidence of uh, developing third degree heart block than someone with uh, an uncomplicated infarction. <clears throat> uh, you'll need the following items to prepare for this uh, procedure, most of which you'll find in your standard transgenous uh, pacing kit, except for the pacing generator. That's usually um, separate. If you have an ultrasound, that's great. <clears throat> Most people will, but you don't necessarily need one. You can rely on a standard EKG machine or even the cardiac monitor uh, during the procedure. <clears throat> so here's an overview of the procedure. Of course, this is a sterile procedure. Uh, it starts off with gaining central venous access, either in the right IJ or the left subclavian. Um, but typically, the left subclavian is less or more of a permanent um, pacemaker. So you want to try to avoid that if you can. You're going to place the cordis catheter in the right IJ. Uh, uh, yeah, the right IJ. And then you're going to attach your sterile sleeve um, to the cordis catheter. You're then going to take your pacing catheter and check the integrity of the balloon to make sure there's no leaks or anything like that. And then you're going to insert the pacing catheter through the sterile sleeve and into the cordis catheter. While you're doing that, you need an assistant um, to make the following connections in step number two. This step is not sterile. Um, they need to attach the leads of the pacing catheter. So the pacing catheter, as you can see, has uh, two leads, a positive lead and a negative lead. You want them to attach the positive lead of the pacing catheter to the positive end of the connecting cable, and the negative lead of the pacing catheter to the negative end of the connecting cable. Unless you're gonna use an EKG machine during this procedure, you need the negative lead um, to attach to the V1 lead of the EKG machine. So you can um, monitor the heart rate. And once you do that, uh, you're, once you advance the catheter about 10 to 12 centimeters uh, into the cordis, um, you've pretty much assured that you're in the SVC. You can go ahead and inflate the balloon of the basin catheter. And this step is very important because it's the balloon, that, the inflated balloon, that's actually going to allow you to float the catheter into the ventricle. And you need to keep your eye on the monitor as you're doing this because you're looking for an injury pattern, like an ST elevation injury pattern, that basically indicates that you've made contact uh, with the ventricle. <clears throat> Once you've assured you're in the right spot, you're gonna go ahead and open the stopcock and deflate your balloon, and then lock it again, and then just extend your uh, sterile sheath over the, the pacing line. I used to have trouble sort of understanding this procedure because there's so many steps involved and the kids have a lot of pieces. But you're basically just attaching, you're connecting the heart to a pacing generator just using two wires. So it's just a simplification of that. You can go ahead and watch this procedure. This clip is a little lengthy, but I think it's useful because they sort of break it down and really uh, simplify the procedure. Plug the connecting cable into the pacing generator. This is typically sterile. This is not. So you want to have a non-sterile assistant help you with this. Ours can actually be atrial or ventricularly paced. We'll put this in the RV. So I'm going to plug this into the V. Now that the connecting cable is all set up, we're going to check the balloon on our pacing wire and make sure that works. So you're going to use the small syringe and the one with the plunger. I mean, this can't draw up any more air than what it allows, and that's a good thing because you don't want it to rupture the balloon. So we're just gonna confirm that our balloon actually does inflate. And then you're gonna deflate the balloon, keep the stop cock open, and now we're gonna use our sterile sleeve. So the sterile sleeve direction really matters. This side is gonna connect to the cortex, which means that the wire has to feed through it this way. 
So we're going to feed the wire through the serial sleeve. And now, we're ready to put this wire in. Now, if you have an ultrasound machine and skilled sonographer, now is a great time to recruit some help and get a sub xiphoid view. That way you can watch this wire going into the RV. And remember, we're following the curvature of the wire here, so it curves into the right ventricle. Wait, what if I don't have ultrasound? <laughs> no big deal. It's all good. You can do this by watching the cardiac monitor and looking for an injury pattern, which we're going to show you in just a second. So for now, you're going to continue inserting this wire until you get to the 20 centimeter mark, which is indicated by the two black lines on the wire. Now you know that the tip of your wire and therefore the balloon are just outside the cortis sheets. That's a good thing. We don't want to pop that balloon. Now we can connect the adapter pins to our pacing wire. And these are going to get plugged in to our connecting wire over here. And negative goes to negative, positive goes to positive. Remember, this is not sterile, so you want to have an assistant help you with this portion. We're going to set this up, have them turn on the pacing generator, and the rate on this one is set to 80. It's okay if you go slower than that, since their intrinsic rate is going to be much slower than that. We don't have to pace the atrium, we just have to pace the ventricle. So this one has options for both, but we're just pacing the ventricle. And I have the output set at five milliamps. You can adjust that if you want, you could go a bit higher if you want to turn it up. You can also change the sensitivity. The sensitivity here is set at three, but if you are troubleshooting and picking up some sort of intrinsic rate, then you can turn that sensitivity down to zero. We're just going to leave it at three for now. Now we're going to insert the wire a little bit further so that we can float the balloon in. So we're going to push that wire down to the 30 centimeter mark, which of course is indicated by the three black lines on the pacing wire. Now it's at 30 centimeters, and I'm going to go ahead and inflate that balloon. And now, probably another five centimeters or so, and as I do this, I'm looking at the cardiac monitor and I'm looking for that injury pattern that looks like a STEMI and lead V1. That's it right there. And you can confirm this on ultrasound if you have it. If the wire is being pesky and just coiling up in the RA, you're going to want to back it out, rotate the wire, and re-advance it to try to direct it into the RV. And then once you've got it, remember to confirm mechanical capture with palpation of the pulse, or you can do it with pulse ox. So I for those of you who have done this procedure, did you use ultrasound? To no, no. no. <clears throat> Alright. Where else do you think it's going to go? I don't know. 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 You received notification for a 40-year-old female struck by an SUV. <clears throat> uh, she's tachycardic, borderline hypotensive, uh, it's adding 60% on the mirror. Uh, she has a GCS of 6. You notice pretty significant facial trauma uh, and facial deformities. There's lots of blood coming from the oral pharynx. Uh, you try to put on some supplemental two, the sat still budge, and the patient is becoming difficult to bag uh, with the bag health mask. You try to go in there with your orange scope, but you have a really poor um, view because of all the blood that's coming out. So, <clears throat> how do you manage this patient's airway? <laughs> Anyone? Come on, say it. Right. Yeah, exactly. This patient needs a cry. Who here has done this? Nobody, right? Okay, none of the residents, right? <laughs> okay, all right. Who has seen this but hasn't done it? Okay. <clears throat> So the indications for this procedure are pretty straightforward. You can't innovate, you can't ventilate, and you can't oxygenate the patient, uh, and you can't place a uh, rescue device. Um, so that trauma case was a good scenario. Other scenarios are really bad angioedema, bad laryngospasm, uh, mass effect for tumors or cancers, uh, massive hemorrhage. You'll need the following items to prepare for this procedure. Uh, you can find most of these items in your standard crank tray along with some other items, but these are really the ones to focus on. Uh, you can either use uh, a size 4 tracheostomy tube or a size 6 uh, cuffed endotracheal tube. 
of this procedure. <clears throat> it's really important to uh, know your landmarks for this procedure because it's sort of a blind procedure in the sense that you know, there's going to be blood everywhere, you might not have a great view. Um, so it's important to be familiar with the landmarks. Uh, recall that you're going for the cricothyroid membrane, which is between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. And in your average size male or skinny, ma skinny male, uh, this might be a little bit easier because you can readily identify their laryngeal prominence, right, the Adam's apple. Um, but for obese men and women, that's not necessarily the case. Um, so a good way to identify your landmarks in these situations is to use Rich Levitan's uh, laryngeal handshake. Has anyone heard of this before? <clears throat> so it's basically a stepwise approach to identifying your landmarks. I want everyone to just try this. So just grab, or grab your neighbor's neck, actually. Yeah. It's probably going to be a little bit easier. Um, you start off by feeling uh, the hyoid bone, and then as you make your way down, uh, you can feel the thyroid cartilage. And going down more inferior, you can feel the cricoid cartilage. And then with your index finger, you can palpate the cricoid thyroid membrane. And <clears throat> you should be very familiar with this approach because it'll really help you to identify your landmarks. There's a couple different ways to do this procedure. I'm going to sort of review the, the traditional uh, technique. Um, so first off, you're going to extend the neck if possible. And you're going to palpate and feel for your landmarks. Identify the cricothyroid membrane with your non-dominant hand, your non-dominant index finger. You're going to make a, a three to five centimeter vertical incision uh, in the skin through the subcutaneous tissue. And then through this incision, you're going to repalpate your one mark and re identify your cricothyroid membrane. Once you've identified <clears throat> the membrane, you're going to make a horizontal incision, less than one centimeter, um, through the membrane. Once you do that, you're going to grab your tracheal hook and grab the inferior border of the thyroid cartilage and lift up. And then you can pass this off to an assistant to hold uh, traction. Then you're going to grab your trousseau dilator and you're going to dilate in the vertical plane and then rotate so the dilator is parallel to the neck. And then you're going to grab your tracheostomy tube or your ET tube and insert it uh, through the blades of the dilator. Uh, the tracheostomy tube actually comes with uh, an operator, which is kind of like a stylet uh, to help you pass the, the tube. <clears throat> right, once you do that, you're going to remove the stylet, uh, remove the uh, obturator, and then replace the inner cannula of the tracheostomy tube, which helps with like mucus plugs and secretions and stuff like that. And then you're going to secure the airway and attach the neck down. Uh, there's also a rapid four step technique um, that can also be used. So, again, you start off uh, the same way, you're going to extend the neck if you can, you're going to pop it for your landmarks. But this time, instead of making a vertical incision, you're going to just make one horizontal stab incision through the skin and subcutaneous tissue and through the cricothyroid thyroid membrane. So you really have to know where you're going. After you make your incision, you're going to use your scalpel as a placeholder <clears throat> and then grab your tracheal hook, this time uh, caudally, full traction, and then you can place your uh, tracheostomy tube or your ET tube. Um, there's a variation on this four-step technique using a bougie, bougie-assisted crank, in which instead of using the scalpel as a placeholder, you can just insert a bougie as a placeholder and then slide your AT tube or your tracheostomy tube over that. There was actually a very small uh, randomized control trial that was done uh, back in 2010, I believe, that uh, just took like 20 residents and med students and had them do uh, the traditional open method and the bougie-assisted method on a bunch of sheep. Uh, and they learned that uh, the bougie assisted method was much faster than the traditional open method. And they both had similar failure rates. So you can use either one, whatever you're comfortable with. <coughs> uh, there's also a percutaneous method in which you're not really making any incision. You're just um, inserting an angiocath with a syringe attached to it into the cricothyroid membrane. And then inserting a guide wire through that needle uh, and passing your tube over that uh, guide wire. Um, so this is, you know, less of a visual technique than the first two. There was a systematic review in 2013 that basically concluded that none of these techniques are uh, superior to any of the others. In this you can go ahead and watch uh, this procedure. This is actually uh, an actual prick.
And depending on uh, how you're going to ventilate the patient, uh, you need one of these two um, items. You, if you want to jet ventilate, you need a jet ventilation kit. If you don't have it in your ED, you can actually call respiratory. They should be able to help you uh, locate this um, item. And if you're using uh, back ventilation, all you need is a 3ml syringe and uh, the tip of a 7 ot 2 adapter. <clears throat> so here's an overview of this procedure. You're going to start off very similar to a crank. You're going to try to extend the neck if possible. Um, you're going to feel for your landmarks, identify that crack or thigh membrane with your non-dominant hand. You're going to take your angio cap attached to your saline filled syringe and you're going to aim for the hyperthyroid membrane at a 30 to 45 uh, degree angle. And once you've pierced the skin, you're going to aspirate as you advance. You should see air bubbles uh, filling your syringe um, to indicate that you're in the right spot. And once you see that, you can um, advance your catheter over the needle until it's uh, hugged at the skin. And that's it. Just remove your uh, needle and attach your uh, oxygen supply. Um, this is what your setup should look like if you're using bag valve mask. Um, again, you want to remove the, the plunger from the uh, syringe, right? You just need the barrel. Yes. Uh, so we've set this up a couple times for SIM, and if you are trying to connect it to the wall, so, uh, to the wall and do like, a jet ventilation type of thing, one thing to know is that because of none of these things are screwed in, every piece blows apart when you actually like connect to 15 liters of, of oxygen. So if you were to try to do this, you would have to like tape reinforce everything uh, because of the pressure is involved. Good point. Yeah, very good point. Um, you can also use some cut IV tubing for this if you don't want to use the plunger, if you want more flexibility with a 2.5 uh, ET tube adapter to connect to the, the catheter. Um, and as far as uh, using oxygen tubing, uh, you can connect it to your wall source, like Paul said, but you're going to need some type of uh, on and off valve uh, to ventilate the patient to control your ID ratio. So this can be a three-way stopcock with one of the open arms, uh, arms open to the atmosphere, which you can cover and uncover to ventilate your patient, uh, or a hand-triggered um, uh, trigger that you can push and release uh, to ventilate your patient. All right, let's go ahead and watch this uh, procedure video. This is a sim video, obviously. For the procedure, stand at the bedside. Use your non-dominant hand, thumb, and middle finger to grasp and stabilize the thyroid cartilage from the sides. Clean the neck. Re-identify landmarks using your non-dominant index finger to palpate the cricothyroid membrane. Use a saline-filled syringe that is attached to a catheter over needle. Insert the needle through the inferior aspect of the cricothyroid membrane while continuously aspirating. Loss of resistance and bubbles in the syringe will signal the catheter is within the trachea. While directing the catheter inferiorly at a 30 to 45 degree angle, hold the needle and advance the catheter so the hub is flush to the skin. <coughs> Maintaining the catheter in position, connect the jet ventilation tubing to the catheter. Ventilations are provided by depressing the trigger on the jet ventilator. The goal is to provide 12 to 20 ventilations per minute. Adequate time must be provided to allow the patient to exhale via spontaneous chest recoil. Exhalation and CO2 removal can be accentuated with gentle manual chest compression. temporizing measure, right? It buys you time to establish a more definitive airway because it's not like an actual crack where you have a ET tube or a tracheostomy tube uh, in the airway, right? You just have some silly, flimsy catheter in there. So you really have to um, look for an alternative, uh, more established airway. Uh, next case, uh, you have a 30-year-old female who's tree of lupus, uh, comes in with chest pain and dyspnea. Uh, she's tachycardic, hypotensive, uh, diaphoretic, she's got some crazy JVD, uh, distant heart sounds. You do a bedside echo and you see a very large pericardial infusion and right atrial collapse. So this patient is in cardiac tamponade, right? And she needs a pericardial synthesis. This is the last procedure I'm going to talk about. So the indications for this procedure, uh, tamponade, is defined by Bex triad, right? 
We have JVD, muffled hard sounds, and hypotension. But as with any triad or pentad, your patient may or may not uh, display all of these uh, signs. <coughs> What's more important is to do a bedside ultrasound to see, um, to check for signs of tamponade. Recall that the pericardial sac normally has 15 to 50 mLs of pericardial fluid uh, for lubrication and shock absorbency. It's not really the amount of fluid that's in the pericardial sac that determines whether or not you develop tamponade, but it has more to do with the rate of rise uh, of, of that fluid. So if you have a chronic effusion that's developing over several months, the pericardial sac will actually expand circumferentially to accommodate several liters, actually, before uh, you go into tamponade. However, if you have a sudden increase of, let's say, 200 cc's of pericardial fluid, and that's going to lead to a very rapid rise in your intrapericardial pressure, and that will lead to tamponade. And some of the telltale signs of this on ultrasound are right atrial and right ventricular collapse. <clears throat> you don't really need much for this procedure. Uh, if you don't have time, all you need is a 60 ml syringe and an 18 gauge uh, spinal needle. Um, if you have an ultrasound, that's terrific, but if you don't, you can still perform this procedure without an ultrasound. Um, there's a couple ways to do this. I'm going to talk about the sub approach. Um, you basically need to identify the xiphoid process in the left costal margin. You're going to insert your needle about a centimeter inferior to this margin at a 30 degree angle. You don't want to go more steeper than that because then you'll risk injuring uh, other organs like the spleen or what have you. The heart's pretty anterior, so 30 degrees should do it, aiming toward the left uh, shoulder. Uh, you're going to aspirate as you advance your needle. And you need to keep your eye on the cardiac monitor because if you see an injury pattern, some ST elevations, then you may have tickled uh, the, you know, the heart itself. You might want to draw back a little bit. But once you aspirate fluid, you know you're in the right spot. You can do a couple things at this point. You can just use your catheter to remove the fluid. Uh, you can uh, insert a guide wire and uh, pass a pigtail catheter uh, over that and drain the fluid that way. Or you can just use a three-way stop clock and drain the fluid that way as well. So you can watch this procedure. Cardiocentesis. The immediate sub-xiphoid approach to emergency pericardiocentesis begins just below the xiphoid process. Insert the spinal needle with a stylet in place to prevent dermal tissue from plugging the needle. Once the needle has punctured the skin, remove the stylet and attach a three-way stopcock and a 20cc syringe. Advance the needle toward the left shoulder while aspirating continuously. The internal images presented here show the needle entering the thoracic cavity and advancing toward the heart. After puncturing the pericardium, the needle enters the potential space surrounding the myocardium. Using real-time ultrasound imaging, guide the needle toward the largest collection of pericardial fluid. Withdraw fluid from the pericardial effusion by aspirating with the syringe. Removing even a small amount of fluid can lead to dramatic improvements in cardiac output and blood pressure. Once the needle is properly oriented to remove fluid easily, empty fluid from the syringe by attaching tubing to a three-way stopcock. Continue to remove pericardial fluid until vital signs normalize and no further fluid can be removed from the pericardium. <coughs> the parasternal approach is an alternative method for performing emergency pericardiocentesis. Insert the needle perpendicular to the chest wall in the fifth intercostal space, just lateral to the sternum. Use ultrasonography to locate the largest portion of the effusion that is close to the body surface and guide the needle into the pericardial sac to aspirate fluid. There's also an apical approach um, in which you um, identify the apex of the heart and then insert your needle towards the right shoulder. But this, this method is kind of risky because um, the lingula of the left lung is very close to the apex, so you have a high risk of causing an MSRS. So that's all I have. Um, I know these procedures are difficult, but you know you have to be familiar with them because you just never know when you're going to get a patient that needs one of these life-saving interventions. Has anyone heard of mental models? No. They're basically coping mechanisms to deal with like high stress and high pressure situations, and you can basically apply these models to these procedures. If you can just imagine yourself doing these procedures going through the steps one by one on a patient, 
um, over and over again. This mental exercise may help to mitigate some of the fear and anxiety that naturally accompanies uh, these procedures. Um, Dr. Uh, Rosh, the founder of Rosh Review, actually gave a talk um, about how he used these models to overcome his fear of some procedures. I'm going to just play a small clip um, from one of his talks. I encourage you, however, to think about mental models in a different way. Not as a tenet or a law, but rather as an operating system for thriving in high-stress environments. As a resident, one of my greatest fears was having to put in a chest tube in a trauma patient. So any time there was a chest trauma, I'd create mental models in my mind of putting in a chest tube. I would picture myself at the side of the patient with a scalpel in hand making a four centimeter incision, using a Kelly clamp to blunt dissect the soft tissue, piercing the pleura, spreading the ribs, entering the pleural cavity, inserting the tube, connecting it to the pleura back, stitching the incision closed. By putting myself in the role of the actual event, while it was not a panacea, it greatly reduced the fear associated with the event. And so this same technique of building mental models for, say, difficult ER procedures could be applied to any area of your life. <clears throat> and that's it. <clears throat> Shout out to my class. Um, there's only two of you here, but love you guys. It's been an amazing four years. And it was a pleasure training with you guys. Also, a huge shout out to the best advisor, co advisor family anyone can ever ask for. That's our Zaki family. <clears throat> Trevor, where are you? I'm here. Well, Trevor's all the way at the bottom because he never wants to hang out with us. He doesn't want to hang out with us either. And of course, this wouldn't be a presentation by me without any cat pictures, right? So, the last time. Here are some pictures of my cat. <laughs> the end. <laughs>